Welcome everyone to the global channel of Pyramid Meditation. We're back yet again on another episode of Wisdom Sharing of the beautiful book, The Untold Story of Sita by Dina Meriam, narrated and explained in great detail by our very own Pyramid Master, Saroja Gullapalli Ma'am. As we progress further into the story of our beloved Sita Mata, we learned, we learned that we learned many different things about the great mystics in the cyclical time of Treta Yoga. Meditation was done by every single person. Self-governance, uh, what we know of as democracy now, was something that came from the ancient times. Prayers were offered to gods and goddesses from the power of thought and not by mere chanting of mantras. And just like we know in Christianity, masters come on to this physical realm in all cycles of time to set the course of mankind. And all of this has been explained to us so beautifully by our very own Minakshi. Minakshi, who is a perfect example of all the human emotions that all of us go through, from anger to guilt and sorrow and then eventually gratitude. Let us join her once again on this journey back in time to reveal to us all that we need to know today. Over to you, Saroja, ma'am, to take us back into time. Thank you, Alekya. I welcome all my beloved masters on this PSSM global platform who are joining me again, myself and Alekya, to go forward on this beautiful journey of wisdom sharing of this great book. They've had two amazing sessions with you guys. And as we move forward, we just can't contain our happiness and the energy that flows through us of that great Mata as we go through every chapter of her life. Today, before we dive in into that bliss, let's spend a few minutes in meditation. So my dear masters, cross your leg wherever you're sitting. Lock your fingers and place them in your lap. Gently close your eyes and be with your breath. For a couple of minutes before the session, let's do Anapana Sati meditation, which is the breath meditation. Follow your breath, my dear masters. Be with your incoming breath and be with your outgoing breath. Breath is the key to the doorway of those inner realms that we connect in our meditation. Breath is a key to the doorway of who we truly are. Follow your breath and sink in step by step into that peace of inner silence within you. Follow your breath, my dear masters. As you follow your breath, you see yourself going deep within, connecting to the stream of consciousness that connects us all in this manifested and unmanifested worlds. Through the stream of consciousness, Let's invoke the energies of Mata Sita with whom we'll be spending the next hour and a half. Be with your breath, my dear masters.
enjoy the inner stillness. No thoughts whatsoever. Be with your breath, my dear masters. Gently rub both your palms together and place them on your closed eyes. Ten, nine, eight, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Kindly remove your palms from your eyes and open your eyes slowly when comfortable. Welcome back, my dear masters. With the energy of Sitama. Let's dive into the story of the untold story of Sita, part three. As Alekhya mentioned, last episode, we left at a point where the energy of Sri Rama gets connected to our Mata Sita and his energy brings her back from those divine realms back onto this earth. That is when Mata declares that this is the energy that I would like to spend my rest of the life. So as we go forward, in Janaka's palace, as I mentioned before, a lot of sages and rishis have been coming and visiting King Janaka because of his thirst for inner wisdom, inner knowledge, there is always a flow of learned Gyani people who keep visiting Mithila Palace. That is the time when one of the great learned yogi or rishi, Saint Gargi, who is a female rishi who has attained a lot of spiritual knowledge in her time, visits Janaka's palace. As I mentioned before, Sita had been spending a lot of time with Saint Gargi. This time, when the great Rishi Gargi visits the palace, there is the discussion about how the law has been taken over by the sages in those times. As I mentioned in Satya Yuga, the rishis and sages would look after what was right and wrong for the kingdoms because it was believed that the rishis of, of Satya Yuga had selfless motives. The only motive they had was the well being of the society. But as we see moving forward from Satya Yuga to Treta Yuga, though many rishis and yogis still had power in what they said, but when it came to their wisdom, not everyone had that kind of utmost intention of the well-being of humankind. So what we were seeing at that time through the example of Menakshi's family, generations after generation, how they have been subjected to the misfortune which had been caused by their great, great grandfather who did something not so nice one of the great rishis, as a result of which, not only he was cursed, but his whole family for next coming generations had to carry the curse forward. As we can see, for no fault of Meenakshi, she had to lead a life 
very sad life, very unlucky life. So when Saint Gargi visits Janaka's kingdom and talks to Sitama, one of the topics that Sitama raises with the Saint Gargi is about, is it right to still leave the capacity of judgment for the society to those great sages. They talk about the value of the words that sages say and the power they have, but till they have the clear mind and the clear intention about helping the humankind, just the power in words alone is not enough. And that is when the discussion happens in Janaka's palace. This is quite important, my dear friends, and hence I'm really talking about this particular one. So what has been decided is whoever maintains law has to be beyond personal feelings because that was slowly vanishing from the system that was there till then. Not only Anasuya's family had been subjected to this misfortune generation after generation. As we go forward, we will see that there are so many examples during that Treta Yuga that makes it so evident that it was time that the judgment had to be removed from that institutions of sages and rishis. And that had to be brought back as part of the fabric of democracy. As I was mentioning before, that the democracy has started in Mithila by great Janak Maharaja. And this was the thought process behind it, that the, to administer the justice, that should be in the hands of the people in the community. So this whole discussion was not just Janaka's instinct. The thought process has been going on for a long time between Mata Sita, Janaka Maharaja, and quite a lot of rishis and sages, and especially Saint Gargi, who clearly sees Meenakshi as a living example of the misfortune, a curse that had given by a sage who could not go beyond his personal feelings. Cursing a particular family for generations together can be something that, ha that happens when you are driven by emotions. So there was a need to establish a justice or an administration of justice, which was beyond this personal feelings or personal emotions. So this is when the starting of the village councils and making sure that the justice remains in the hands of those village council have slowly started taking shape in Mithila. Now coming back to Mata, one thing that Menakshi always could see was as Mata was growing, wherever Mata went, they could see a real connection of Mata with the nature. Wherever Mata went, the flowers and the fruit, they just bloomed on the trees in her presence because she is nature herself in human body. Where she is, the nature flourishes. When her energy is withdrawn, obviously you will see the nature starts diminishing. This was so evident to both Soma and Meenakshi. Those were the days when Meenakshi and Soma was also accompanied by two other maid servants to look after Sitama and her affairs. So here comes Usha and Rohana, along with Meenakshi and Soma, to take the responsibilities of Sitama, as well as her sister Urmila, who has also come into picture now after a couple of years of Mata coming into existence. So I'm just telling you all the scenes as they're developing. On one hand, they're th thinking about setting up village councils. This is the beginning of democracy. And that is the time when Janaka is slowly retreating from governance. So Janaka's, Janaka's motive has always been to see that the village councils have been set up well so that they can take care of themselves so that when time comes for his retreat, which in his mind is after Sitama's wedding, when Sitama leaves Mithila, Janaka has no intention to keep on ruling Mithila because to him, he has done what's required for this earth he has done what's required for this humanity by bringing Sitama, by invoking Sitama to take birth on this earth. And now when he has trained Sitama in the right direction, given her all the wisdom and knowledge that he can share with her, he decides 
that it's time for Sita Ma to move on along in her life. And so along with that, Janaka is already making preparations of making sure that the Mithila kingdom should be left in such a way when he retreats that they can look after themselves. As I mentioned earlier, my dear masters, this is the quality of a great leader. Even when the leader is not there in his absence, when things happen in autopilot mode, that is when the leader is successful. If the kingdom is always dependent upon a king, that doesn't show any leadership of a king. We are seeing a great example of a leader in Janaka who is setting up everything that can decide among themselves, can administer themselves, and will not be dependent or looking forward to someone to give them advice or any kind of judgment from time to time. Now, here we are slowly entering into the preparation of Swayamvara of Sitama. So as I mentioned before, that in Sitama's palace, there has been a bow of Mahadev Shiva. Most of us know this story how the bow of Mahadev Shiva is in Janaka's palace. So just for those, as a reminder, Parashurama, before he finished his avatara, or before, before he concludes his avatara, Parashurama has a big bow, which was given to him by Mahadeva. When he is finishing his avatara, his incarnation, he was looking for a place where he could leave this bow, which could be in good hands, and there is no fear of this bow falling in the bad hands because that was a bow given by Mahadev Shiva to Parasurama. And he wanted to make sure that he leaves it in the hands of someone who has got human benefit in the utmost of his heart. And who better than Janka can that be a person? So Parasurama, before he retreats, he brings that bow and gives it to Janaka Maharaja and asks him to look after it. That is how this particular bow has been in Janaka's palace. When I say to Janak Maharaja, it need not necessarily be the current Janaka, the Sira Dhaja Janaka, because Janaka is the name of the dynasty. So there could be earlier Janakas who have had the pleasure of taking this bow under their custody from Parashurama. So as the story goes, that particular bow is being kept in a very safe place in Janaka's palace. And people have never gone and even tried to touch that bow because they all know it is a very, very sacred bow given by Mahadev Shiva. At that time, when, she, when the Sitama takes birth, she's very little child, maybe around a year or less than a year. It is the story goes, which we all know through other um, mythology or through other um, texts that we have learned, Sitama, when she's very young, she's playing and her toy, which could be a ball or any toy, just goes to that place where that bow is. And in front of everyone, everyone can see Sitama going to that place. She's very young. And because that ball is behind the bow, she just very easily pulls the bow to one side and picks her ball and puts it back again in the same place the bow is. Janaka and Sunainama is quite amazed because that bow given by Mahadeva is no ordinary bow and it's very, very heavy. Many people who think that they are big warriors have failed to lift the bow. And here, Sitama very easily pulls the bow, push, puts it to side, picks her toy and puts it back. And that's another evidence of the great Shakti in the form of human incarnation. So that day, this particular Siratvaja Janaka Maharaja, he makes up his mind that whoever comes and is able to lift this bow, my daughter shall marry him because he knows that his daughter has his Shakti. So he makes sure that he does not give, his, give the hand of his daughter to anyone less. So this is the background. And hence, when they have Swayamvara, Swayamvara, as most of us know, my dear friends, is a way of how the royal princes used to get married. So people or princes from all over the planet or wherever they would come to seek the hand of the princess. And then whatever the challenge may be, they would have to prove themselves and seek the hand of the princess. 
So that is what a Swayamvara is called. And here the princess has got the full freedom to choose who she wants among the invited. So this is the start of the Swayamvara preparation. And Sitama is feeling a little bit sad because very soon her dear Sitama will be leaving them. But having said that, wedding is always a happy occasion, no matter where it is. And the whole palace is really moved by all the preparations that they're doing. So finally, we see that the Swayamvara time comes. That evening, they have the Swayamvara organized in Janaka's palace. Janaka cannot go anywhere because he is totally tied up with making sure that all the guests are looked after who come for the Swayamvara. At that time, they realize that the farmers in the kingdom need some help about how to cultivate their land. Sita Ma, look at Sita Ma, how much she has people's well-being in her intention when that particular farmer needs help and Janaka expresses that I'm not able to go and help them. Sita Ma says, that's okay, uh, Baba, I will go and I will help them. And Sunaira Ma says, how can you help them? You're a very, so Sita Ma was beautiful and quite delicate. So for, for people who just saw her physical appearance, it was very difficult for them to understand that how this delicate girl, this beautiful girl, would, could go and help a farmer in the field. At that time, Janaka explains his wife, what you are seeing is Shakti Rupa. It's an incarnation of the great divine Shakti. Not only that, I have taught Sita that no physical work is impossible if you have strong intention in your soul. So Janaka's training has really made Sitama to do any kind of physical activity. And then they show that Sita, then the book follows that Sitama goes to that particular field where the farmer needs the help. And there is a new type of cloth that Janaka has invented to help the farmers. And Sitama easily manages to take that particular plow, which is quite heavy, and starts plowing the, plowing the field. And as they are plowing the field, Sita Ma is so attached to the soil, she takes the soil and tries to smell and says to Meenakshi, Meenakshi and Soma, they're always there with Mata because that is their responsibility to be next to them. And Sita Ma says, there is vital life in the soil that prevents illness, that keeps our bodies well. Life that we cannot see or touch, but we can only feel as long as we keep our soil pure, disease will stay away. And this is the gift of Mother Earth. Such great words which are applicable even today. It is so important not to pollute our Mother Earth because her purity on that depends our well-being. In such great words, Sita Ma tries to explain it to us through this book that as long as we keep our soil pure, diseases will stay away. And this is the gift of Vasudharama. As I always say, my dear friends, the story, do not think that it was only for Treta Yuga. Though Rama and Sita may not be in their physical form, but the message is the unconditional love. Everything that they have distributed and taught in those days are equally applicable even in this time or in any time. So as Sita Ma is smelling the soil, suddenly the same love that brought her back from meditation when she was in the divine realms that have brought her back, back to this particular planet or to this existence, she can feel that love dawning on her, on her once again. So then she puts the soil down and looks around and she sees in the farther corner, she can see a chariot and two princes there. So she gently puts the soil down and then she she goes to that point where she sees the chariot. By the time she goes there, the chariot is gone. So she asks the farmer, who were you talking to? Because she knows that she has felt that love, that she had felt that before. And she wants to know who, who are those prince whose arrival has made again that big difference in her, the universal love that has been flowing through her all of a sudden. So then the farmer says that those two prince, they are from Ayodhya kingdom. And she asks, have they, uh, have they come for the Swayamvara? And he says, no, they are not particularly here for the Swayamvara, but they definitely would like to see Mahadev's bow, which is going to be displayed in Swayamvara today. And then Sitama understands that this is the prince in 
her inner realm she could feel that eternal love that could that was the only thing that brought her back from those divine realms back into existence with her baba so then as the story goes as we know rama um sorry sita ma urmila and this four servant maids meenakshi soma usha and rohana just before the swayamvara um that that's the tradition of mithila to go to the temple of parvati ma and to do the aarti um which is lighting camphor and praying parvati ma so as they are doing it suddenly sita ma can feel the same love the same feeling that she felt in the um in the fields and for a couple of seconds she can't even turn back because she knows that wherever that energy is coming from is close to her so beautifully explained my dear masters and when she turns around she sees rama and lakshmana who have also come to the temple but the way they show even the servants the servant maids four of them meenakshi soma usha rohana they also turn around but they cannot see anything in the place of rama all they can see is blinding light they can see lakshmana but they can't see rama and because the light is so blinding that is coming from rama meenakshi turns her face away because her eyes can't handle and just as soma is about to turn her head away the one thing that comes in her heart is oh my god this light is blinding me i cannot even see the face and at that time she hears voice of her mata in her heart which says soma do not focus on the light try to see beyond the light as i said soma can really communicate non verbally with mata and mata can hear all the feelings or the intentions of soma so this non verbal communication makes soma to turn around and then when she tries to see beyond that blinding light she is mesmerized by shri rama his pleasant form and she is so happy so this is how sita ma first time sees the physical appearance of shri rama in her in in her that incarnation so then that is followed by the swayamvara and as we all know shri rama very easily picks up the bow and then janaka declares that sita ma will be married to shri rama so the whole marriage is not a big fanfare because nothing is show in janaka's palace they do exactly what's required they cherish what has to be cherished so this marriage is done in such a beautiful way that it remains in the heart of mithila and all the invitees who have been there for the wedding so as the wedding wedding takes place and uh, shri rama stays in mithila for a couple of days before he takes sita and goes away there are a few things that happens between um janaka and shri rama so at that time janaka knows that it's not in the destiny of videha videha is mithila kingdom it's not in the destiny of videha to lay foundation for future civilization because he know after the wedding mata is going away to ayodhya and he does not have any heir so definitely his dynasty will not go forward and he has already decided to retreat to the forest and pursue his meditation so he has accepted it he's happy that it's okay if videha if mithila kingdom does not play a role to lay the foundation of the future civilization but he knows ayodhya in the form of rama and the future generations will take the civilization forward and and will lay the foundation for the future society so he thinks ayodhya has got so much force it's like the outer force it's their army and how they've been extending their empire so this is my opportunity to talk to rama and give him all the inner knowledge that we mithila people have so rama is taught then about the beauty of soil and its living quality shri ram has not been introduced to all this shri ram has never been close to the nature like how sita ma has been because in ayodhya it is all about how can we conquer the world more and make ayodhya's ayodhya kingdom bigger not that they are bad people they are quite good but their focus is all outwardly shri rama has been brought up very well he has gone to vishwamitra's gurukula he has learned quite a few but the part that janaka teaches him is that 
which which videha people are very rich in which is the knowledge about the nature the knowledge about the inner realms and the connection to the nature and mother earth so as a result of that janaka is teaching shri rama all these things with which he thinks that will make shri rama complete to become the future king or uh, and lay the foundation of the society of the future generation so shri rama is taught about the beauty of soil and its living quality and also the governance by the local councils this was one of the important things that mithila was developing and shri rama has the chance to learn that the kings can let go and help people to form their local council and teach them governance by local council so the idea of democracy has been seeded into shri rama's mind with the help of janaka so till then um, shri rama has has gone to Vas saint vasishta and vishwamitra and he has learned lot of things janaka knew very well that time had come now it is the decline of videha and it is the ascension of kausala kausala is ayodhya so we call videha kingdom and then that is kausala kingdom and ayodhya is a main capital of kausala kingdom and janaka knows it quite well that this is the time now the decline of videha and the ascension of kaus kausala which is ayodhya and dasharathas and shri rama's empire by then dasharatha has expanded his empire and his influence in all direction when it comes to the external might like the army and the armed forces videha is no match to kausalya um to to kausala but there's only one exception videha is the seat of knowledge as i've mentioned before so the wedding of shri rama and mata sita is just not a marriage of two individuals it's a marriage of two kingdoms it more than that it is a marriage of might and power with knowledge and this marriage between the power and the inner knowledge janaka knows will bring bright future for the aryan civilization which will develop in the future the spread of culture and civilization and this will also help in the progress of the human species as the world progresses forward janaka knew that in the coming yugas when earth will be going through the declining cycle the spiritual knowledge will also be declining and the world will be full of lust for material achievements and they will be going for advanced developments and all that will be the material life outside so he wanted to dedicate his life to preserve the knowledge through the dark ages to come and that was one way by sharing all that he knew with shri rama who can take that along with him to ayodhya and can lay the foundation of a society which is a foundation for the future societies to come he knew this marriage between rama and sita is a marriage for mankind because we know sita ma was exposed to sages every time in janaka's palace there was non stop flow of great rishis and sages who used to come and discuss with janaka and sita ma was always exposed to the wisdom of great sages i have discussed about sita ma's discussion with the great saint ma gargi so sita ma was trained very very well and janaka knew that by giving all the knowledge he has to shri rama this would be his last responsibilities before his withdrawal he knew that his time for withdrawal has come and very soon after mata sita and shri rama leaves mithila he will be withdrawing to the retreat that he has always always had in his mind so the key teachings that janaka has given to shri rama is about self governance which he says that this is a counter to self interest by rulers so it's very important that all these times when people when great sages have cursed people because of the not having the clarity in their mind there has been self interest and that cannot go on so self governance is the only thing which counters self interest <clears throat> and also he says to sita sita when you go to ayodhya you must plant the seed of dharma 
in people's mind. This is in preparation to the coming generations. He tells Rama, you must begin the foundation of this self-governance after going to Ayodhya, which will set foundation for the coming generations in millennium. So he's not talking about 100 years or 1,000 years. He's talking about thousands and thousands of years to come. The work that needs to be done will be for the benefit of the humankind. And he says to Sri Rama, this is role of you and Sita for the coming generations in this world. And then the time comes when Sita Ma has to go with Sri Rama. And this is very beautifully shown in this book. There is one incident that I have to mention here, which is quite important because as we go forward into part two, the reference of this particular incident will be again arriving at that point. So there in the palace of Mithila, that part where the animals are kept, that animal welfare is being looked after by one of the person who is called Kiran. And his job is to look after the animals. And he does with very pure heart, with all the dedication. And it is shown that the Kiran, that a person Kiran has interest in Minakshi. But because Minakshi has resigned that she was not going to marry, as we know about the discussions that we have had in the past, that Minakshi's father Dushyanta was against Minakshi's getting married because of his belief that the curse that her, their family has, if Minakshi gets married, then her, then her husband and uh, her children will die. Because of that, um, Minakshi has never, never entertained any thought of marriage. So whatever messages or unspoken indications Kiran has showed towards Minakshi, Minakshi has never paid any attention on that. So Kiran just keeps his love for Minakshi in his heart. So when, when Sita Ma is going with Sri Ram to Ayodhya, um, Sita Ma says to all these four, Minakshi, Soma, Roha, uh, Usha and Rohana, that if it's okay with you, I would like you to come along with me to Ayodhya. All the four feel so blessed because to them, there is no life without Mata and all the four heartily accept the invitation to go along with Mata to Ayodhya. And Janaka thinks that this would be fantastic. Sita Ma, along with these four, when she goes to Ayodhya, it is like taking a part of Mithila with her and she won't feel lonely. And whenever she feels or she remembers Mithila, she can always talk to these four and of course Urmila. So, when the time comes for their departure, such beautifully explained that when Janak Baba comes out and bids farewell to his daughters, Urmila and Sitama, the other four, the four servant maids who are about to embark on the journey from Mithila to Ayodhya along with Sitama, they are just standing there and seeing Janak Baba bidding farewell to Sitama. Somewhere in their heart, they must be feeling that if only we had somebody, they would also be bidding farewell to us. But here the love of Janak Baba is displayed in such a great manner. Janak Baba comes back to all the four and embraces them and says, you are no less than daughters to me. They haven't spoken anything, but look at that great saintly Janak Baba who sees his whole kingdom has his children and he embraces all the four and he says, you are all my daughters like Sita and Urmila. You are going along to Ayodhya with part of the Mithila and me along. So be each other's strength and make sure that the knowledge of Mithila goes to Ayodhya. It's a beautiful way. This particular farewell of Sitama is very well depicted. So with this, the chapter of Mithila, where Sitama is leaving Mithila and going to Ayodhya. So from here, we enter the Ayodhya kingdom when they reach Ayodhya. Ayodhya is quite different to Mithila. They see there is so much show and pomp everywhere. The whole royal culture is really shown in every way. When they enter the palace, it is quite different to what Mithila is. As I mentioned before, masters, Mithila is mainly on simplicity. Janak Baba always made sure that nobody gave importance to external beauty 
It was all about inner beauty. And even the palace was decorated exactly in the same fashion. Whatever was really made by the artisans and the local people in the kingdom, that would be decorated in the palace. Everything was so close to the heart of people. Uh, to, it, this is a totally contrast to Mithila, where as they enter the palace, you could see the grandeur. Everything was so expensive. Things were brought from different part of the world and displayed to show how wealthy and pompous was Ayodhya. So that contrast, these girls from Mithila, including Mata and Urmila, can really see and they really feel out of place because they come from a very simple, very simplicity background. And now they are in a place which is far from what they are used to, but they all feel happy that they don't feel alone. They have come, four of them have come along. But one thing they're always worried that it's okay for us. We have four of us for each other. But what about Mata? How is she going to have take this contrast? But Sitama, who is nothing but the mother nature, she knows that everyone is close to her heart. So from the time she steps into the palace, it shows that she just spreads love everywhere she goes. Whoever comes in contact with her, they're just taken away, blown away by this beautiful love. And so they see that for Sita Ma, there is nothing impossible. And Sita Ma has become part of the fabric of Ayodhya. Whereas these four girls, they're still slowly getting used to. The only one who has gone a little bit forward and try to be a part of Ayodhya is Soma. The other three are still finding the great contrast between Mithila and Ayodhya. So then within a year, we come to know the story that we all know of. Before I jump to that story, which forms the main part of the Ramayana and now the Sitayana, that one year, everyone can see the love that's blossoming between Mata Sita and Sri Rama. And this is no ordinary love. This is a divine love that if someone is presence, someone is there in the presence of Sita Ma and Sri Ram when they are together, that unconditional, that blissful love just encompasses everyone who is in the vicinity. And they all feel the same love that Sita Ma and Sri Ram feels in their heart. So this love that I'm talking about is that great bliss. This goes beyond the personal needs this is the love that Sita Ma and Sri Ram has shared with everyone in Ayodhya, not only in Ayodhya, with the whole Mother Earth, with the nature, and with everyone for generations to come. And this love has been explained so beautifully in that less than a year period where Sita and Sri Ram spent their time after their wedding in Ayodhya. All the Maharani's Kaushalya, Kaikai, kai, when Sitama comes, like everyone is so moved by her love. And this is what they all can see, that they are not complete without each other. Sitama and Sri Ram, they form a complete nature when they are together. And everyone can see that so clearly. That is the beauty when they are both together. So as we know, the story, the part that we all are aware of, Mata Kai Kai, we start, the story starts with Mantra, the, the maid of uh, Queen Kaikai, who sows the seed into Kaikai Ma's mind about asking the boons from King Dashratha. And then in that point of time, when her, her mind is beyond her control, Mata Kaikai goes to Dashratha and asks for the boon that she would want Sri Ram to go to exile for 14 years in the forest. And she wants her son to be made the king. And I don't have to explain that story because everyone who knows Ramayana knows about this. So when the time comes, then Sri Rama happily accepts it. And it's very much understood that Sita Ma will cannot be separated from Sri Ram. So it was given that if Sri Rama is going to exile, Sita Ma will be following her, no questions asked, because they can easily see that they both cannot be complete without each other. So when Sita Ma is preparing for her exile, then all these four people are thinking that what will happen to us? But in the mind of Soma and Minakshi, they have already made up that their minds that if Mata goes, we have to go along with her. What are we going to do here without Mata? 
So when they start packing up, so beautifully Sita Ma says, no, so Mami Nakshi, this time you cannot follow me. This is my journey. This is my Sri Ram's journey. You will have to say, stay here. So Soma and Minakshi, they are really taken back because for them, their life exists with Mata and they cannot imagine anything but being with Mata. So when Mata says that, no, you have to be here because with your presence, you will bring that hope in this palace because once Sri Ram and myself are gone to exile, this palace will not be going through great times. And that is the time your presence is required to look after the people here who would have lost their hope at that difficult time. Then all the four, they say, Mata, without you, how can we be here? We have never had a life without you. Since you were born, we have spent all our time in serving you. What can we do here? Then she says, this is the time when you can serve being here, not being with me. And when they have a question mark, like how can we serve you being here when you are going to forest? She, through her spiritual power, she lights a flame. We say in Sanskrit, Chidagni, this is the fire that is in every being. And Mata being, being the divine force is able to take that divine energy, a part of the divine energy from her and puts it in a vessel. And there comes a big, nice, beautiful flame. And she says, this is part of me, what I have left here as a flame. This is my flame. So the four of you, she teaches them a mantra. And she says, every day, you four have to take turns and chant this mantra sitting in front of this flame. And this is the flame that will give all the energy to you people to protect Ayodhya Palace. It is very important. And with that, she says, I'm leaving. But she gives responsibilities to all the four before she leaves. Apart from looking after the flame, she says, Usha, you have to look after my sister Urmila because Rama's brother Lakshmana is coming along with Rama because he cannot imagine a life without Sri Rama. Urmila will be left on her own and she will be devastated when Lakshmana leaves. So Usha, you will look after Urmila. Soma, you will look after Ma Kausalya because once her son is gone, it's going to be a very difficult time. Rohana, you will look after Ma Sumitra because her son Lakshman is also leaving. And for Meenakshi, she says, Meenakshi, you will look after Ma Kaikai. Meenakshi is quite surprised. Why would you be, you want me to take or look after Ma Kaikai, who is the cause of all the misfortune that has come to you and Sri Rama? You have been just married. And because of her, you've been sent to exile. Why, do, why should I have to look after Ma Kaikai? So here they show the beautiful nature of Mata, her kind nature to everyone. And she says, more than anyone, it would be Ma Kaikai when she comes out of her present frame of mind. What was her present frame of mind? Her frame of mind was to make sure Sri Rama is sent to exile and his brother Bharata is given the crown. So Mata can see that this is only happening because of the clouded nature of her mind at the present moment. And once the cloud clears and her consciousness comes out, she will be able to see what has been done wrong from her. And at that time, there will be no one in the palace who will stand next to her because who would want to stand by the side of a person who is cause for all this grief? So look at her kind hearted, her generous heart. She asks Meenakshi, it will be your responsibility to make sure at that time when Ma Kaikai needs somebody, you will be the one. So here what Mata says is so beautiful. She says to Meenakshi, do not think that it is because of Ma Kaikai that we are going to the exile. She is only a means to what has to be done. Even if Ma Kaikai wasn't there, Sri Rama and myself, we still have to go to the forest. Ma Kaikai has been used into this big divine plan because of her personality, because of her nature. But even if it wasn't for Ma Kaikai, there would be someone in this big divine plan because of whom we would have to be going to 
through the exile. So Sita Ma realizes it's not the cause she's looking at. She's looking at the effect. And what is the effect? Effect is that Sri Rama and her, they have to go on this forest exile. This is the cause and effect principle. This is the karma principle that she's talking so well, my dear friends. And this is what we need to understand. So many times when something goes wrong with us, we hold the next person responsible. We think it is because of him or her that this fate has been, mis misfortune has fallen on us. So many times we say, oh, because of her, you know, I'm going through this pain or because of someone. It is not because of someone, my dear friends, that we are going through this pain. It is because of the divine plan, or you can call because of the karma, the cause and effect. The cause has been initiated already somewhere. And the effect that we see is now. There has to be someone who has to come in this picture to connect the cause and effect. And Sitama being the divine energy can understand that, that today the effect, which is her necessity to go to the exile along with Sri Rama is the effect of a cause that has already happened or is happening somewhere else. And Ma Kai Kai is only an instrument to make this happen. So beautifully explained the law of karma, my dear friends. If we can think in that way, every time if things happen that we are not happy with, let's not hold responsible someone else. If we can understand that this is the law of karma, this is the cause and effect story that's happening in our life. We will not hold anyone responsible for whatever misfortune or happy moments that happen in our life. As we all know, we create our own reality. So we cannot hold anyone responsible. In this terms, in this story, this particular incident of Bata and Sri Ram going into the forest, later there is more discussion about the main reason why it is happening so at this stage we will leave it at this point saying mata understands the big story and later soma will explain us what she has learned through mata so she says to minakshi that minakshi you look pretty sad soma is already resigned to the fact that she cannot go with mata so she she, she always takes mata's word as gospel so she says that is okay i will look after this flame along with the other three. So she has already resigned to the fact and she's happy that yes, I'm looking after Mata's responsibility from Ayodhya. But Mata can see Minakshi. Minakshi is not happy leaving Mata. So she comes to Minakshi and says, Minakshi, you, you have brought Mithila here along with you. And now with all the great knowledge that our Baba has given us, your responsibility is to look after the people of Ayodhya, which I'm assigning to you for. And then, because Meenakshi knows that she's quite aged now and 14 years is a long time before she can see Mata. She says, Mata, I'm not sure if I'm going to be here alive by the time you come back, but am I ever going to see again? Or this is the last time am I go going to see you? Mata says, I will see you again, Meenakshi. This is my word. And Meenakshi is not sure if Mata said it or did, did she feel it? But whatever is the case, Minakshi feels very, very happy that all this is happening and Mata is definitely going to see her before she leaves this incarnation. So with that, Mata Sita and Sri Ram leave Ayodhya and they go on their journey to the forest. Now back in Ayodhya, things do unfold. Dashratha leaves his body because of the sorrow. And then Ma Sumitra, Ma Kosalya, they're all in great grief. But because of the wisdom of Mata Sita, Soma looks after Ma Kausalya, Rohana looks after Ma Sumitra, and Menakshi, who's always there for Kai Kai Ma, because Sita Ma has requested her to. So Sita Ma's word is the final word for her. So without any further thinking, she's there to serve Kausalya, um, Kai Kai Ma. So when the situations are going in this manner, <laughs> as the time progresses, Mata says to them one thing before they go, you people have to just behave as if I'm still in the far, in the palace. So Soma and Menakshi, whose, whose responsibility is to look after Mata's needs, every day Soma will take dress out for Mata as if Mata is still there in the palace and she will lay it on the bed for Mata, all her jewelries. Every day this is a routine for Soma and next day she will remove that and put another dress and all the jewelries. Mata want them to spend a life in Ayodhya in her absence as if they are in Mata's presence. Mata do not want them to even think for a minute 
that she's gone away from them. So Soma is nicely following that responsibility that has been given to her by <coughs> Mata. As the time passes away, um, Usha passes away, leaves her physical body and she's, she dies. Rohana has been called back to Mithila because one of her relatives are not well. So from that point, you, you, we do not see Usha because she had left her physical incarnation and Rohana is back in Mithila. And the two people who are still remaining, who have come from Mithila in Ayodhya is Soma and um, Rohana. I'm talking from the servants. Um, so as the time passes, um, Meenakshi can feel it that her health is declining. But because Mata has given them responsibility to look after that holy flame, they both take turns chanting the mantra that Mata has taught them. And both morning and evening, they're doing their responsibility. One thing Soma sees that when she sits in front of that flame with closed eyes in meditation, she is slowly feeling that there is a connection through that flame to Mata and she's following Mata wherever Mata is going on her exile. The flame is like a portal to Soma through which she can slowly follow Mata. Then she understands why Mata has left this. So it is exactly in the story as we go forward, we will see through Soma's words that that flame that Mata left there was a two-way communication between Mata and for Pinakshi and Soma. Meenakshi cannot relate to the flame as much as Soma does, but Soma, through Soma, she, she comes to know everything that Soma is able to th see through the portal. So as I said, it's a two-way communication. Soma is able to see, to feel Mata's presence wherever she goes through that flame. And she feels that Mata through that flame is sending her energy for the production of Ayodhya. That's so beautifully depicted in that book. So as Meenakshi's health is declining, Soma can see Meenakshi is getting weaker and weaker. And not only that, she can also see that Meenakshi's willpower is also going down and nothing is really keeping her happy. So one day, um, Soma goes to Meenakshi and at that time, Meenakshi is about to get up and falls over and Soma realizes that so Meenakshi is not able to see well. Her sight is really declining. And at that time, when she sits in front of the flame, through that flame, she's able to contact Mata. And Mata tells her what kind of um, the roots that she has to pick from the forest, which will form a good medication for Meenakshi's sight. Soma goes next day to the forest. And exactly as per Mata's instruction through that portal that she receives communication, she makes it a nice paste and applies it for um, Meenakshi. And Meenakshi says, what are you doing? Since when did you know what to pick from the nature? That is when Soma explains that that flame that you're just looking as a flame is not a flame, it's a portal to Mata. And I'm able to communicate to Mata. So I did mention to Mata about your eyesight and this is what happened. And Meenakshi is really overwhelmed with joy because she knows wherever Mata is, Mata will never leave her or Mata will never leave them. So just to bring her spirits up because Meenakshi is feeling quite low. One, because Mata has left them in physical uh, form. And number two, she knows that her energies are coming down and maybe she's getting closer to end of her physical incarnation. So to cheer her up one day, Soma takes Meenakshi to Sarayu River very early in the morning at dawn time. And there the scene that they see, the place where Mata Sita comes to Sarayu and prays, prays to Sarayu Mata and where she worships, that place has become such a big ground. And there are so many women who are from Ayodhya, they are joining there and chanting mantras, singing songs for Mata's welfare and they're amazed because they think Mata has not spent that much time in Ayodhya for these people to get connected. But when they see that all the women in Ayodhya are really so much worried about Mata because Mata has taken this responsibility on her shoulder and she shows to Meenakshi, Meenakshi, it's just not you and me that are worried about Mata or who are interested about Mata's welfare. Look at all these women who have joined here and are praying for Mata's welfare you should be happy. So with that, Meenakshi is feeling so much relief 
because she feels that if I go away, who is there to look after Mata except Soma? Soma will be alone. But that scene on Saru River gives her that hope that it's not Soma alone even after she goes. Every woman in Ayodhya is praying for Mata's welfare wherever she is. So when she comes back home, she feels so happy. But then the next day when Soma goes to visit Minakshi, Minakshi says, I'm really happy. I'm ready to go away. I know I don't have many days left. But there is one thing that's really bothering me, Soma. And when Soma asks, asks Minakshi, Minakshi says, before Mata left, and I was expressing my grief, that will I see you, Mata, again? I felt that Mata said that I will see you again, Minakshi. I'm not sure if I imagined or Mata really said. Soma said, no, I heard it too, Minakshi. You definitely heard it from Mata. When Soma says that, Minakshi is quite happy that it is just not her. Um, it's just not that she thought she heard. It's actually a fact. Then she says, but Mata, how can I see Mata? She's so far away. And I'm not sure how long am I going to live. So at that time, Soma asks her to go to the Sarayu River one day when it is dawn. And she says, you will see for yourself. So Meenakshi goes all by herself to the Saryu River one early in the morning. And when she goes to Saryu River, she is full of emotions because that reminds her the first time she goes to Saryu River. So what happens if we haven't covered it in the past is when Mata comes to Ayodhya, Mata is so much used to going to the nature and spending time. So she feels a bit suffocated that she has she's not getting a chance to go to the nature. So one day, this is soon after her coming to Ayodhya, she takes Meenakshi and Soma and she dresses up like a maid. And otherwise it's very difficult for Mata to escape the palace. So she goes along with them to Saryu River. And this is the first time Mata is seeing Saryu River. She's so overjoyed with the beauty of Saryu River. And then there, she makes, she cleans up a place and prays Saryu Mata. And Saru Mata, the divine energy comes out and so happy to meet Mata. And so Soma remembers, um, Meenakshi remembers that first meet of Mata with Saru River in that place where they both had gone with her. So thinking about Mata, she slowly walks into the river and she is half, uh, like half submerged in the river to her waist. And all she can think about is Mata, nothing else. And then her heart is full, full of sorrow because she knows that her time has come. But how can she see Mata? And she keeps saying in her heart, Mata, when am I going to see you? And suddenly she hears Mata's words saying, Meenakshi, why do you worry? I'm already here. So when she opens her eyes, she sees Sita Ma is standing on the bank of Saryu River. She's so overjoyed and tears are flowing. She cannot speak. And then Sita Ma, She's got a shawl around her. So Sita Ma takes her shawl, asks Meenakshi to come out and covers with the shawl saying, don't be in the water for so long, you'll catch a cold. Sita, seeing Sita Ma, Meenakshi is, has, absolutely has no idea about her emotions because she's crying nonstop. She cannot move, she cannot speak. And then Sita Ma says to her, I do not have to come to you in physical form for you to know that Wherever you are, I am there. So this is so beautifully, the words are so beautiful. It says, you do not need to see this body to know that I'm with you, not just for this life, but for all the time. Such a beautiful message saying that even if I'm not in this physical form, any incarnation you come with, I am always there for you. Such a beautiful message. And when we go forward, we will see that that message is so true and how Meenakshi in her next life to get connected to Mata just by thinking about her. It's, it's such a beautiful way. And Mata wraps that shawl and Meenakshi wants to follow Mata and Mata is going away into the forest again. But Meenakshi cannot move. No words come out of her and Mata has already gone into the forest. Meenakshi comes out, comes back to the palace and is so overwhelmed with emotions. And when she uh, meets Soma, Soma asks her, where did you get the shawl from? So Meenakshi tells her the whole story and Meenakshi is just short of words and she says, come, I need to show you something. 
So she takes Minakshi and goes into Mata's bedroom where Mata's dress is laid. And she says, this is the shawl that you're wearing that I put along with this dress for Mata to wear. See, Mata has given back the shawl. And then they see the hem of the dress that they have put out for Mata is wet, which is showing that Mata was wearing that dress and coming had come to Sarayu River for Minakshi. So beautiful. Wherever you think Mata is, is there, you will not have to see Mata in physical form. That is why in the beginning of the book, it was so well explained that Mata, Sita, and Sri Ram were great rulers and great persons when they were in physical form. But their love and their greatness comes out even better beyond their physical forms after their physical incarnation. And this is what we are seeing now. So that night when Minakshi goes to bed, Soma asks, are you happy now? She says, yes, I am. I have seen my Mata. But she says to her, after I go away, will you be there to receive Mata? She asks Soma and Soma says, Mata has not gone anywhere for me. Mata is always there for me. So why should I wait for Mata when Mata is always there for me? And Minakshi can never understand Soma's dedication. And she thinks, what a great dedication this woman has. And she says, I would like to go back to Mithila. Minakshi is already feeling sad that she wants to be in Mithila. She says, I feel I, this is not my home. Ayodhya is not my home. And then Soma says, don't worry, Minakshi. It will be your home one day. And when you come back, I will be waiting for you. Beautiful words. And with that, Minakshi slowly drifts off to sleep just for us to know that she has finished her incarnation. And the beautiful paragraph, which I have shared in every session, would like to share again, which really blows us away. One life falls away and leaves its imprint in the sand, giving rise to another life, taking along the memories which do not die, do not get washed away. They simply sink to the bottom of the mind sea and rest there, folded in the many layers of the mental sediment until called forth to help the soul on its journey towards full awakening. So beautifully written that when we finish one incarnation, all those memories that we have about that incarnation are safely, safely preserved in the sand of time. And when we take the next incarnation, we grab those memories that are required for our soul evolution into the next incarnation. But where are they? They are in our subconscious mind somewhere. And whenever we need them for our evolution, we will pick them out, we will drag them out, use them, and then it will go back to our subconscious. And we will see, my dear friends, Minakshi's incarnation is done. But when Minakshi comes back in her next incarnation, exactly that what I've shared you in that paragraph, she will pick whatever she needs from her subconscious ocean and will use her and will use it to her own knowledge as she moves forward in her evolution. So my dear friends, that is the end of the Menakshi story. <laughs> and that is the finish of part one, which is Menakshi finishing her physical incarnation. So now we are into part two. So part two is the story of Anasuya where Minakshi has now taken next incarnation and come back to Ayodhya. She's born in Ayodhya as Anasuya. So join me along this journey of part two, where we go ahead, listening the story from Anasuya. So Anasuya was born in a Kshatriya family. Kshatriya means warrior caste. And that was the time when it was the last declining time of Treta Yuga. So Treta Yuga is the time when Ramayana, Sitayana is going on. And uh, this is the time when Sita Ma has already um, left her physical body. And Anasuya is born very close to Sri Ram's departure as well. So after Anasuya takes this incarnation, six or seven years after that, Sri Rama also finishes off his physical incarnation. So just to give you a bit of sense of time, this is when Anasuya is born in a Kshatriya family, a warrior caste. And a father worked in the administration as a very loyal servant to Maharaja Sri Ram. And one of his qualities, he works untiringly, exactly like how Dushantya, her previous father, also worked very un uh, untiringly and he has been loyal 
So of all the children, um, Anasuya is the youngest and the only girl. And she has brothers who are much older and they're all married. So because she's the only girl left at home, so she gets very close to her mother. And from a very early age, she finds great satisfaction in serving her parents. And that's how she wants to spend her life. So because of her seva, seva is because of her serving nature. And where does she get her serving nature? From her previous life. If you remember, my dear friends, her father Dushyanta had taught her nonstop about what serving is. You remember how much we talked about? Her father tells her that you should not be going, feeling that any job is less or more. You need to put all your soul and heart in whatever you're doing and nothing is too low for anybody. So when you are serving, put your heart into it. So I hope you remember that has gone so well in that, in, in her consciousness, in her subconsciousness. And that's what I was telling you in that paragraph. And now when she takes the incarnation of Ansuya, that quality automatically comes out from that subconscious nature. So because she's so good at serving her parents, her parents are quite happy. And her father keeps saying to her mother, Anasuya will make a very devoted wife because her nature is to serve. But Anasuya was never intent on marrying. So this is where her story starts, where her father wants to get her married, but Anasuya doesn't want to get married. And we know why, we'll talk about it in a little while. So by the time Anasuya reached the age of seven or eight, um, their beloved Maharaja Sri Ram had died leaving his two sons, Lava and Kusha, to rule in his stead. And at that time, what they show, that a Gurukula, Gurukula is like an education institute, a hermitage, which was maintained by great sages to give education to the younger generation. But in Sri Ram's era, they have established a Gurukula, especially for young girls, and Sita Ma had big role to play. The education of girls had been a passion for Maharani Sita after her death, Sri Ram made it a priority to establish a place where girls could go for learning. There had been so much resistance from the society because prior to this, there wasn't any school for girls. But now because of Sitama's passion and Sri Ram totally agreed with Sitama, they have started this non-residential school for girls. Earlier, it used to be only for the high society people, but Sri Ram makes it open to everyone in the community because in Ayodhya, what they believe is power without wisdom could lead to unwanted results. And how do they know that? Because that is the time when Ravana is slowly building up his power. So this is where the Ravanas, we slowly come to know a bit about Ravana as we keep going forward in part two. So they all know about Ravana in the South, in Lanka, that Ravana is one of the most knowledgeable and scholarly figures, but because of the ego that, he's ha that he has, he has grown so arrogant beyond control as a result of all the power that he's gained because of knowledge and scholarly um, scholarship. Now, Ayodhya people totally believe that power without wisdom could lead to unwanted result because they have seen Ravana as an example of that. And they believe that each Ayodhya Vasi should learn humility, devotion and service because these are the prime quality of Maharaja Sri Ram. And he has been an example for all the people in Ayodhya. So now talking about Gurukula, which is the education institution, and now the ones, one for girls, where Anasuya has started going. And because she's the first girl in her family to attend a school, mother is very proud to send her daughter because she, definitely they take a lot of pride that from their family, no, no other women had a chance to go to Hermitage to learn more about the sacred text, about the inner knowledge, about different knowledges. So this experience turns out to be a very mixed one for Anasuya. Why? Because one day the teacher, when he's reciting the narrative of Sri Rama and Rajkumari Sita, at one point when they come to a story, when he starts saying that Sita is captured by Ravana in story. And that's how people knew that story at that time. Anasuya cries out that it's not true. And she runs away from the group. So teacher goes and brings her back and tries to convince her that that's what happened. Sita was captured by Ravana, but she refuses to listen to that and breaks down. So her father is called to the Gurukula and she's taken back home. So on the way, father asks, why did you break down? 
what Guru said is right. What do you think led to the great war between Rama and Ravana if it was not the kidnapping of Maharani Sita? Then Anusuya says, I'm not sure, but what I know for sure is she was not kidnapped. I'm sure of that. Of that. They don't understand how this little girl can be so sure. Then the family have decided not to discuss this part of the story ever again. So they all know, yes, there was a war between Ravana and Rama. Ravana was defeated, but Anasuya knows that it had nothing to do with capturing of Sita Ma. Somehow Anasuya feels that the part about the abduction of Sita was the betrayal of her and the diminishing of her abilities. Surely Sita Ma could have protected herself. If not, Maharaja Ram would have never allowed this to happen, but she could never express her emotions because they were all raising from that sands of time which she had buried inside in her subconscious nature. Who else than Meenakshi can know who Mata truly was because she in her past life spent so many years looking after Mata being her best mate. So once she is withdrawn from the Gurukula and she's not going to the school anymore because she does not want to hear the fake story that she thinks about Sita, teachers are saying. So now she's starting to help her mother more in the kitchen and the story goes on that she is so much taking care and wherever possible she is doing the house house duties and now her father thinks that yes it is time for her to get married anasuya's favorite place in ayodhya is, ayodhya is the sacred river sarayu she never understands why she loves sarayu river, river so much it gives her deep inner comfort to sit by the riverside and listen to the music but with so many foreigners that were entering into Ayodhya at that time for trade and exchange, it was no longer considered safe for young girls to be outside alone. And hence her father said that she cannot go alone to Sarayu River. She has to be accompanied by a member of the house, household. But she felt, Anasuya felt that she had a message from the river which could only be given to her if she went alone. So she always waited for the opportunity so that she could go alone to Sarayu River, but it never happened. So the message from Sarayu River was never transmitted to Anasuya. Thinking back, maybe if Anasuya had a chance to go to Sarayu River, maybe Sarayu River would have reminded her of her previous incarnation. But anyway, my dear friends, that never happened. So now the whole story as it moves forward, now Anasuya's parents are very much eager to get her married because she has turned out to be a beautiful girl who is really good at what she does. And her father he started looking for a good match. And then he finds another person in the king's administration who, who's got a great son and who's going to make a good match for Anasuya. But when that topic is again raised at, at home, Anasuya bursts into tears and declares, I would never marry. It takes long time for her to calm down and then the father doesn't understand and she says, please don't force me, father. But father says, I want to understand your feelings. Why this reaction? And then Arsuya says, you would be surprised to listen to the same statement because I know I will die if I marry or my children will die. This is exactly in her previous life. Her father has really drilled down into Meenakshi. Meenakshi wanted to get married. But at that time, her father kept saying that if you get married, either your husband will die your children will die and great misfortune will come, come upon you. But look how it happens, my dear friends. The subconscious mind is so powerful. She has no idea why she's saying what she's saying, but she knows something terrible happened, happened to her. She just knows it, she says. So when this happens several times, her parents are very much worried. And her father thinks that there is a deep-seated fear in her, perhaps from a past life. So they have a feeling that this cannot happen. There's nothing happened in her life. She's so young. This definitely be her past life. They take to so many, take her to so many doctors, but nothing really shows any result. And at that time, one day her mother says that I've just have heard about one of the Mithila attendants of the Maharani who came along with Maharani to Ayodhya and she's still alive and she lives in the forest and she's said to have great healing powers and she lives near the hermitage where Maharani spent her last days. So we should take um, Anasuya to her. Maybe she can treat Anasuya. And then she says, Maharani had conveyed all her knowledge about the nature of the plant medicines to this lady um, whom we should go. And people from all over the world, they travel 
to this particular woman for healings. And then she says her name is Soma. So my dear friends, our great Soma from that long time back is still alive. And she has learned all Mata's wisdom and Mata's connection with nature. And now her incarnation is still continuing. Though Meenakshi has finished her incarnation, Soma hasn't. So you can imagine Soma must be so old by now. So then Anasuya's father asked her mother to take Anasuya to Soma. It's a long journey. Anasuya has never left Ayodhya. So along the journey they show, Anasuya is so happy. So Anasuya doesn't know if she's happy because she's leaving Ayodhya for the first time or this name Soma rings a bell in her subconsciousness somewhere where she feels that there is a deep connection and she cannot wait to meet Soma. So when they reach the hermitage, the gurus of the hermitage are waiting for them because they have received a message. So they say, you must take some rest. But Ansuya wants to meet Soma immediately. And she says, no, 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 we want to go right now. And the hermitage guru says, no, she doesn't live here. She lives in the forest from here. And it's not wise for you to travel now. So why don't you relax today? We'll take you tomorrow. That night, Anasuya cannot sleep. There is a kind of curiosity. There is a kind of anticipation. She doesn't know why her heart is ringing just by the thought of Soma. And she thinks, maybe, maybe there is something that I'm going, going to know. And because the guru says that Soma has been with Mata for so long. So she thinks, this is the woman that I can ask her and clear my doubts. I can discuss with her my gut feel that I know Mata was not captivated by Ravana. This is the woman Soma that I should talk about and clear my doubts. So with a lot of anticipation, next day morning, they go to Soma's hut, which is in the forest. And just when they are about to enter the hut, Ansuya tells her mother, mother, is it okay if I go alone first and then you can um, join me later? Then her mother says it's fine because her mother is quite happy that her daughter wants to meet Soma and there's no resistance from her. So they show as Anasuya enters and opens the door of that little hut. And as the light streaks go inside, in the corner, she can see a woman, a small, it's a small hut, a woman sitting in meditation. And when she tries to look at the woman, she doesn't see any old woman. What she sees is a beautiful young woman with dark hair streaming down the sides of her face, but her head covered simply by an orange cloth. An orange cloth is a color that sages used to wear. So she's sitting in deep meditation. She thinks, I thought there would be an elderly woman. How come there is this beautiful woman? And slowly that vision only lasted for brief seconds. And as Anasuya steps closer, the beautiful woman transformed into a very aged figure, an old woman sitting in meditation with her eyes closed. Emotions rolls inside Anasuya. She does not know why by seeing this woman, her emotions are rolling. And at that time, because of the noise that women hears, Soma opens her eyes slightly and she says, come child, come inside. And no words emerged from Anasuya's throat. She wants to introduce herself, but she cannot talk. She's so overwhelmed by emotions. At that time, Soma says, come closer child. I cannot see you from that far. So when she goes closer, her face crinkles and a look of confusion shots across Soma's eyes. And now she fully opens her eyes from meditation. And for a few moments, she's silent. And then she whispers, whispers, it is you. So Soma has recognized Anasuya that this is Meenakshi from the previous life. And if you remember the last words that I told, Meenakshi asks her, will you be there? And Meenakshi says, yes, I will be waiting for you. And Soma realizes that this is what I'm supposed to do. I was waiting for Anasuya. But our little Anasuya, totally oblivious of her previous incarnation. But she knows there is some connection between herself and this gorgeous looking elderly woman. And then Soma says to her, how lovely you are, my child. And there is the love that flows between Soma and Anasuya is beautiful, is beautiful. So one important thing that we will talk about before we finish this session today is when they ask her name, says, what is your name, my dear child? Her mother says, Anasuya. And 
So she says, oh, so you are named after the great sage Anasuya. Mata loved her very much. And if Mata knew that your name is Anasuya, she would be very pleased. And then her mother says, yeah, my ch child Anasuya, her name, she's been named after the devoted wife of Rishiyatri. And then what Soma says is something we all need to understand. Soma says, is that how she's no now known in Ayodhya as a devoted wife? This is about Anasuya, she's saying. She shook her head and she says, Sage Anasuya is as great as any stage sage who ever walked this earth. She under, undertook such great tapasya as only few male sages could do, could do. And this earned her the adoration of the three great devis, Lakshmi, Saraswati, and Parvati. Through her tapasya, she helped to create so many things on this earth that would shape for next generations to come. Sage Anasuya had a heart of a mother and the wisdom of a jnani. Her wisdom and love were perfectly balanced, which is why she was able to help Mata prepare for what was to happen in Lanka. So here, a new statement is revealed, which is going to be the base of the story from here on. So what Soma says is, it was Mata Anasuya who prepared Mata Sita for her trip into Lanka. So that itself shows that Mata went into Lanka out of her own. She prepared very well before she entered into Ravana's mind, into Ravana's kingdom. So my dear friends, with that great statement, I would like to close this particular episode here. And when we meet next, this Saturday, same time, we will talk about what was the story behind Mata to prepare to go to Lanka into Ravana's empire, into Ravana's heart, to bring that change that would be the foundation for the generations to come. Thank you very much. Over to you, Alikya, madam. Thank you, ma'am. There were so many things as a part of the story, which I feel I myself, because it, it's, it's a, it's a it's a it's a roller coaster of emotions that we go through once we read a book of such depth, and the way that you shared it with us, um, I, I read the book, so it gave me time to introspect on how we also meet people in our life, um, which triggers a spark of knowing within us, and yet we don't listen to that calling, um, like our connection as well. Clearly, there must be something in the past which has led to now. Uh, so for all the viewers, um, like ma'am said, um, it's just for correction, today we're sitting on the 21st of April, Tuesday. Uh, we will meet again on Thursday, uh, or April 23rd, um, from 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. Um, please uh, feel free to write your comments in the comment section or you can also write emails to us. Ma'am is available on Facebook under the pen name of Saroja's Self-Empowerment if you have any questions. And uh, you can get your own copy of the book, uh, which is available on PDF. If you write an email to us, we'll be happy to share that with you. Thank you so much, ma'am. We will meet again on Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you.